America is at the height of its power. Innovation and invention will define a new era of prosperity and technological wonder. One invention will change the world, along with the biggest communications revolution ever seen. And while old threats fade, new challenges will test America as never before. We are pioneers and trailblazers. We fight for freedom. We transform our dreams into the truth. Our struggles will become a nation. The 1970s. America is locked in a global standoff with another superpower, the Soviet Union. It's the Cold War. Communism and capitalism clash in an ideological battle for supremacy. For many, it's an era of fear and uncertainty, nuclear nightmares. By the end of the Cold War, the rival countries will amass enough explosive firepower for over a million Hiroshima's. But the Cold War has another battlefield, the space race. And when America claims the prize by putting man on the moon, a technology that will define the era comes of age. Television. 185 million Americans are united in front of their TV sets. Looking back at those images now, we marveled at the clarity of the picture. This was live from the moon, after all. It was the height of technology, and we marveled at it. In 1940, there are just a few thousand TV sets in the whole country. By 1970, there are over 60 million. TV will play a defining role in shaping a new era. America has always tried to adopt new technologies. Television as we, as we know it today, I mean, it was considered, think about this crazy idea where we can send moving images to any place in the United States. But America's been built on technological innovation and invention. From steamboats and six guns to automobiles for everyone. It's conquered a continent with technology. But throughout the nation's history, it is communications technology that's played a defining role. 1865. The telegraph helps President Abraham Lincoln win the war for the North. He virtually sees and can command every battle. 1945, David Sarnoff, Eisenhower's most senior communications expert, helps develop television for America. By 1950, Sarnoff creates one of the biggest TV broadcast networks in the world. TV may be a new form of entertainment, but it's also the most powerful communications device in existence. Sarnoff recognized that there was going to be awesome power, and that with that awesome power was going to come, become awesome responsibility. By 1970, the American public is watching more television than any nation on Earth. Over five hours a day for every man, woman, and child. There are more TV news programs than any country in the world. Over 70% of the adult population Watch the television news every evening. And when pictures of the moon landings are broadcast live, it isn't just a technological success. It's a symbolic victory in the Cold War. But there's a real war closer to American lives. Vietnam, a bitter conflict in Southeast Asia. America fears communism will sweep the region, and wants to stop its influence. But the U.S. military and all its technology comes up hard against determined guerrilla movements. And the war is being fought by hundreds of thousands of drafted young Americans. We ask so much of our 18-year-olds to go over to a foreign land, a jungle no less, and fight guerrillas who are home. 
on their turf and don't like at all the invading army. The generation that's fighting the Vietnam War are the baby boomers, the biggest ever American generation. Over 50 million new Americans born in 15 post-war years. This huge generation are unlike any Americans who've come before. And their influence and attitude towards society are destined to change the face of America. The 1960s were inevitable. The greatest generation came home with a fixed idea of what life should be about. And they were so busy uh, putting their own lives back together again in a traditional fashion uh, that they weren't paying attention to the changing sensibilities of their children. America, in, in a way, reinvents itself uh, every 10 or 15 years. And um, it, and that, that reinvention is always feared by the generation that, that came before. June 1969, upstate New York. Woodstock, a weekend concert for over 100,000 ticket holders, is overrun by nearly half a million baby boomers. Over a million more try to get in. It's the world's biggest ever music festival and becomes the boomers' coming out party, a signal to America of the generational change taking place. Going from, from a society and culture that was fairly buttoned up and prim and proper to one that suddenly was, uh, well, we had Woodstock, we had um, hippiedom, we had free love. Baby boomers had a huge, tremendous impact on how we view the world and how we view society. But the baby boomers aren't just rebelling against their parents' values. People began to attempt to affect from the streets the highest levels of foreign policy. The baby boomers want an end to the Vietnam War. And they take their protests to the streets. But the willingness to stand up for what you believe in, in mass demonstrations of revolt, that's very American. <laughs> in the Vietnam War, people were unwilling to die for something they didn't believe in. protest is deep in the American character. The pilgrims against the old world and religious persecution. The colonies against the British and their taxes. Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman against slavery. 1970. There have been thousands of anti-Vietnam War protests. Kent State University, Ohio. The National Guard are ordered in to control 500 protesting students. Television is here watching. Four students are shot dead. I think that that drove it home for a lot of Americans to see on their television and to have this mass of people who felt so passionately about it, the images. You know, America is a very visual country. And because Vietnam is the first televised war, battles and casualty lists are daily news events. Television brings the reality of the war into the nation's living rooms. Just as a hundred years ago, Civil War photography revealed the true horror of war, now, TV news images begin to turn the nation. We had already lost over 50,000 soldiers, many more wounded than that. I think most Americans realize Vietnam was a hopeless cause. More bombs than were dropped in the whole of World War II. Hundreds of billions of dollars. But what most Americans remember are the pictures they see on their TV sets. Watching people in Saigon clinging to helicopters as we left in disgrace. This is a profoundly un-American notion. 1975, and the Vietnam War is finally over. In many ways, it really was the anti-war movement on the ground that shaped our story of Vietnam and, to some degree, the actual experience of the war. For many of the baby boomers, 
the protest and rebellion has a wider aim, to create a completely new way of life. You could rebel against your parents and rebel against society while creating your own utopia. This is a very 60s ideal. Creating a land where you can live your dreams is part of the American character. It's the reason the pilgrims came to America. Why Mormon pioneers headed west. The baby boomers aren't looking for a new land. They want to change American society, make it a fairer place. As the 60s turn into the 70s, black activism, Native American land rights, gay rights, ecology and feminism burst onto the agenda and the streets. The baby boom generation shaped America, the movement for equality for women in the workplace certainly came out of that. A tiny moment in American history gave a lot of confidence to uh, American women. Freedom is freedom. All men and women are created equal. I had no prior knowledge of the Watergate break-in. I neither took part in nor knew about any of the subsequent cover-up activities. 1974. President Nixon is implicated in the break-in and the bugging of his political rival's headquarters. He's accused of covering up the crime. Congress starts an impeachment process which transmits live on television. Holders of the highest offices in the land are subjected to a grilling watched by millions. The Nixon administration hits the TV age and loses. There had been scandals previously in American history, but none that unfolded on television with the immediacy of the Watergate scandal. What was revealed by the Watergate scandal was a level of internal corruption, a level of deception, and a real violation of American democracy that even critics of the American government up to that point simply hadn't imagined. It was the last nail in the coffin, you might say, of, for many, many people, of Americans' confidence in their own society. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. The only president ever to resign the office. His speech, watched live by 85% of all American households. Freedom of the press and TV showing their true power. I mean, the, the power of Watergate is saying you need a free press because there are some things that you will not learn if you do not have a free press. While television proves the downfall of one president, throws America into crisis, another will learn to use this new technology to rebuild American confidence and usher in a new era. As the 70s turn into the 80s, America feels bruised. The Middle East oil crises, American hostages in Iran. Surveys show only 22% of Americans trust the government. Unemployment and inflation are both at the highest levels since the Great Depression. America has endured economic downtime before. In the 1930s, Roosevelt tries to bring America out of its Great Depression with government spending and new initiatives. But he also harnesses the power of a new medium, radio, to speak directly to the nation. Franklin Roosevelt had this truly mysterious capacity to speak through the radio in a way that compelled not just the attention but the affection of millions upon millions of his countrymen. Now, half a century later, a new president uses television in his attempt to restore the nation's confidence. How can we not believe in the greatness of America? How can we not do what is right and needed to preserve this last best hope of man on earth? His uh, nickname was the Great Communicator. He was able to articulate in a way that many people would accept as being innately American. Americans wanted to believe that their country was good and strong. And Reagan spoke to them in a voice that said, yes, we are. My fellow citizens, I'd like to speak to you tonight about our future, about a great historic effort to give the words freedom, fairness, and hope, new meaning and power for every man and woman in America. Specifically, I want to talk about taxes. 
The 1980s appeared to be a new era of American financial prosperity. Low interest rates and the easy credit that flows lead a business boom. Over the course of the decade, trading on Wall Street markets breaks records. The Dow Jones Index rises more than 200%. By the 1980s, 100,000 Americans become millionaires every year. There have been boom times before. The oil rush leads to cheap gasoline and cars for the masses. And cheap steel leads to a construction boom, builds new cities. Now in 1980s America, cheap credit creates a boom in consumerism. The credit card is the symbol of the decade. Invented in 1958, once reserved for the wealthy, now it's democratized. By 1989, more Americans have credit cards than vote in elections. The ADC cardholders increase their debt by a factor of five. By the end of the decade, Americans are spending nearly a quarter of a trillion dollars on their credit cards every year. During the 80s, the number of shopping malls surpasses the number of high schools. There's a 78% increase in fast food stores. Spending on restaurant food more than doubles to over $250 billion in a decade. During that decade, we probably became more materialistic than we'd ever had before. Consumption was off the charts. But what consumers really want is technology, the latest home appliances, the latest entertainment technology. There are barely 2 million VCRs in 1980, over 63 million by 1990. From a few thousand cell phones, by the end of the decade, there are over 5 million. Your first pocket knife, your first bicycle, your first car today, you know, your first cell phone, your first laptop, all these are badges of gaining control over your world, of having, being able to live life better because you have a better tool and the skill to use it. That's something that's deeply appealing to the American psyche. But many of these consumer technology advances are developed directly from the biggest spending spree of all. Okay. The space race. The Cold War with the Soviet Union is still going strong, laying out across the globe and the final frontier. By the end of the Cold War, $7 trillion has been spent, keeping America ahead of her communist rival. The result? One of the most sophisticated and daring spacecraft ever built, the Space Shuttle. The space shuttle was a beautiful idea, it was an elegant craft that would be more efficient, more economical, because it could, it could take off and land and be reusable. And the shuttle adds to America's consumer boom. One of its primary functions is to launch communication satellites, helping expand America's ever-growing appetite for entertainment, communications, telephones, and GPS. And the technology that goes into the shuttle also comes back to Earth cell phones, water purification, airplane landing gear, firefighting equipment, cordless power tools, medical tech, and even ski wear. All benefited from the shuttle program. For many, the shuttle is symbolic of the American story. It's like one of those self-fulfilling prophecies. You know, uh, let's work for a better future, we'll get the better future talk about the frontier spirit it's not a question of succeeding or failure it's just it's, it's just continuous growth which is really inspirational but the nation's faith in technology is about to receive a blow the shuttle is a new era for america space age technology is powering the country forward the nation's been built on innovation. New technologies create progress, wealth, expansion. As axes improve, forests can be cleared at a greater rate. And new military technology wins wars. Makes 
nations. Throughout our history, every one of these technologies has been transformative in a way that has changed economies, it's changed lives, it's changed settlement patterns. It takes entrepreneurs like Andrew Carnegie. He takes new steel production techniques and supersizes them to produce vast quantities of the raw materials that build the great American cities. And engineering geniuses like Mulholland, his 223-mile LA aqueduct allows a city to grow from the desert. But progress often carries a human cost. 1825. Building the Erie Canal to connect the Great Lakes to New York City claims nearly a thousand lives. 1865, the Transcontinental Railroad, almost 2,000 lives. At the turn of the century, two out of every five men die or are disabled building the skyscrapers of America's new cities. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Now, the space shuttle is the pinnacle of a new era of American technology. 1986 is to be the fleet's busiest year. The crew of the Challenger shuttle is chosen to represent a cross-section of modern America. Different races, backgrounds, professions. And the idea always was can we begin to open this up somehow to more people than just highly trained astronauts? The dream of spaceflight is extending to everyday Americans. The shuttle is seen as an easy, safe route to the final frontier. Go and throttle up. But on January 28, 1986, just 73 seconds after takeoff, Challenger explodes, live on national television. You could see that it took the audience a few seconds to realize what they were seeing because it was so hard to interpret. Seven lives lost. All of a sudden, it was like, how could that have happened? I mean, NASA, the United States, we're, we're like the best in the world at this. What happened? Challenger, go and throttle up. It was like a blow to the gut of the nation. And uh, we do fail at times. But the greatest test comes from what happens after you realize and accept the fact that you fail. Do you go crawl into a corner and never do anything again? Or do you get back up, dust yourself off, and move forward? Just three years after Challenger, the Cold War is over, and so is the space race. While one generation has dreamed of their future in outer space, the next will create theirs on a new frontier, cyberspace. Individual entrepreneurial ideas run wild, and that really is the American spirit, and it's a way to figure out how to fully utilize something that's out there. In 1873, on his kitchen table, an Illinois farmer called Joseph Glidden invents something that changes the face of America, barbed wire. Within 10 years, over half a million miles of barbed wire parcels up a billion acres of the Midwest and turns open prairie into the breadbasket of America. eighteen seventy nine thomas edison invents the electric light bulb it will generate a further one thousand patents but he also creates the first commercial power grid within two years he sets up five thousand power plants in five more he creates a further one hundred and twenty seven thousand electric light and power across the nation we're a nation of entrepreneurs. We have this incredible entrepreneurial spirit. But one 19th century American invention introduces an idea that will shape our 21st century world. In 1850, the looms in cotton mills 
are automated with paper punch cards. The holes in the cards instruct the loom to use different colored threads, switching one color on, one color off. It's binary code and the key to the future computer revolution. At first, computers don't seem like a revolution. In the 1940s, a single computer with the power of a basic PC today could be the size of a Greyhound bus and needs the same amount of power as a small town. Many people believe that only a few computers will ever be sold, but then they start to reveal their power. In the 60s, computers are used by universities to achieve previously unthinkable calculations. And from the 1970s onwards, corporations use them to replace thousands of manual clerks. Cold War superspending helps fund computer development, helping companies like IBM to become massive corporations. But it's not corporations or the government that create the next computer revolution. 1976, a garage in Northern California. Two computer hobbyists, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, create the world's first practical personal computer. The original kind of pioneers of the digital revolution, in a sense, they were building computers for themselves, for ordinary people like them. They weren't particularly wealthy. They weren't particularly, they weren't working for large organizations. They just were tinkerers. Soon, competitors bring out their own machines. But when IBM launched their PC, it ups the game. Computers are changing fast. Along came the mouse, and along came pictures on the screen. That kind of competition is really where innovation comes from. The Apple II of 1980 has more computing power than was used in the entire Apollo moon landing program. Personal computers become more powerful, more popular. There are just 300,000 PCs in 1980. By 1990, there are over 67 million. That year, Microsoft sales alone topped $1 billion. But the true power of computers is yet to be realized. Only when they start to talk to each other will the computing revolution be complete. In 1969, a communication revolution begins. Four computers start talking to each other down a telephone line. It's the birth of the internet. In a sense, it's in our kind of DNA as a country to try and jump on whatever new form of communications technology is there because it was so essential for our kind of ancestors in building this, this, this larger nation. By the mid-19th century, the continent's vast distances shrink as the horse and wagon give way to the railroad. Along with the railroad spreads the telegraph, the internet of its era. Messages that once took days or even months to reach their destination now travel down the wire at the tap of a button. One young railway clerk from the Midwest has a vision of how the telegraph and railroads could revolutionize the way we do business. By 1900, the Sears catalog transforms how Americans buy and sell. A century later, the internet takes this revolution one step further. By 2005, almost 200 million homes have computers and internet access, with over $5 billion of goods sold online in 2009. You realize that just the power of this connectivity was unstoppable, overwhelming, incredible, and scary at times. From the first email sent in 1969, by 2009, 90 trillion emails are sent worldwide, 247 billion every day. 
This spirit of, of liberty, of freedom, of openness um, has been a really core part of the internet and a sort of basic idea that everyone should be able to participate equally uh, in this new medium. It's a very American spirit of an idea, uh, this idea that everybody should have access to knowledge. And in 1990s California, the internet boom sparks a second gold rush. Gold rush mentality still existed over 100 years later when Silicon Valley got started. And the secret of Silicon Valley was that people were willing to take huge risks. In 10 years, 30,000 new high-tech companies launch. Silicon Valley creates nearly a million new jobs in the 1990s. Venture capitalists inject over $121 billion into high-tech companies in 1998. But not every dot-com entrepreneur makes a fortune. In the Silicon Valley culture, it's perfectly fine. If you have a brilliant idea and you try it and it doesn't work out, people accept that. Hey, you know, they don't all work. Uh, but if you did a good job at it, hey, you'll probably get another chance. In March 2000, the dot-com bubble bursts. But the world is transformed. While people didn't make as much money as they thought they were going to make, everybody got online. And the country got wired and embraced this new technology much faster than it would have had there not been a big boom. And so just as the gold rush kind of invented California, I think the internet boom days didn't make as many fortunes, but they did wire the whole country in a, in a really transformative way. But as the information superhighway comes of age, America wakes up to a new and terrifying threat. It came quite literally and metaphorically out of a clear blue sky. Nobody saw this coming. It was the blackest day in American history. No doubt about it. Someone said, uh, General, you need to turn on the television. I did that. And I watched along with the world as the second jet hit the second tower. On the morning of September 11th, 2001, Two passenger planes, hijacked by terrorists linked to Al-Qaeda, crash into the World Trade Center towers in New York. When it first happened, and I first realized how bad it was, it took a while to under understand how bad it was, and uh, realized it was the worst attack in our history. I remember thinking, well, the world is gonna change. I'm not sure how but the world is gonna change. 34 minutes later, a third plane, American Airlines Flight 77, hits the Pentagon. At 10.03, a fourth plane, believed to have been heading for the Capitol or the White House, crashes near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, after passengers on board take on the hijackers. We were stunned, we were frozen. And I know in our small community, that same feeling of helplessness and hopelessness was replicated out across the United States from coast to coast. We watched while the fires developed. It was a horrible event, but almost no one, certainly no one around me, had any idea that the integrity of the entire towers was at risk. At 1028, the World Trade Center's North Tower also falls. And there was a line of ambulances up the West Side Highway. It just went on forever. And they never called the ambulances, and nobody ever came. And after a while, I began to realize, like, oh my god, there aren't survivors. The 9-11 attacks claim almost 3,000 lives in New York, 
Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C. People would walk up 6th Avenue completely shell-shocked, and they'd be covered in white dust because the towers had just fallen around them. You know, people call 9-11 our generation's Pearl Harbor. It was an attack by an enemy that no one really saw coming. It was devastating. This was seen almost as a declaration of war by Al-Qaeda uh, and transnational extremists uh, on the American homeland. But the worst attack on American soil serves to galvanize the nation. I believe the terrorists attacked us for two reasons, to kill a lot of people and to kill our spirit. And they did kill a lot of people, but they didn't kill our spirit. People displayed a very brave attitude in the way they dealt with it. And I think the terrorists never expected that. Belief in freedom and the courage that it can give you overcame the uh, ability of the terrorists to try to uh, destroy the spirit of the country. It was really weird being in the city after 9-11 um, because the city was so quiet. People get on the subway, no one would speak. People were very polite to each other. You know, just everybody would move in, people would give up their seat, they wouldn't talk. It was just weird. It was almost like um, they realized how fragile everybody was. Despite what happened and the horror and the loss, kind of amazing that Americans could rebound and you know, they came back to New York. America came back to New York and helped New York, and spent money in New York, and visited New York. We were able to do something so quickly, so expeditiously, in terms of getting back to order after the travesty of the World Trade Center when it came tumbling down. To have done that so quickly is amazing. You have the worst attack in the history of the country in this small little tip of the island, and then 10 years later, you go back, and it's filled with people. There are more people have moved there than ever in the history of that neighborhood. Historically, didn't have that many families living in it. And now the playgrounds right around the, the spot where the planes hit are filled with kids. And so there's kind of this sense of like, yeah, try it, fine. You, you can fly planes into our buildings, but you know what? We're going to go back, and we're going to build a new life for ourselves there. America rebuilds and looks to the future. 400 years ago, adventurers crossed an ocean and began an experiment that would become the United States. They saved up every penny they had so they could take a treacherous ship ride to the United States and then come to a country where there was nothing here. They had to make everything themselves, build everything themselves. America was born out of adversity. It's, it's like in our DNA. At the start of a new millennium, the American experiment is still underway. This is an unfinished country. We're not fully completed and settled and settled down. That we're still opening new space, new territory in which to move, and we're still incorporating new peoples who continually transform the very DNA of our society. The last decade of the 20th century saw nearly 10 million new Americans welcomed into the country more than in any other decade of the country's history. I think the unsung heroes began with the first people with the courage to get on those very small wooden ships in 1607 and have continued up to today. I always tell people, if you just walk down the cab rank at National Airport and list where people come from, you realize that the spirit of immigration and the spirit of a better future hasn't disappeared at all. In 2007, one in eight Americans was born abroad. My mother's Cuban and my dad's Australian. My mother's black, my father's white. But America is this melting pot. You know, I'm a black Latino with freckles. <laughs> and that's kind of America. We're this melting pot, and we always have been. We've been the place that people are desperate to get to because they know once there, their story can be written. It can be anything. Each society in the past created tremendous innovations in civilization. All of a sudden, we have them all here 
It's not just one philosophy, it's many, many philosophies, which makes for a very creative country. In the past 20 years, two thirds of new immigrants have come from Latin America and Asia. I think the theory that you can be anything that you want in America is not a theory, it's a truth. It's a basic truth that plays itself out in every immigrant story. That's really what America has always been about. Coming from someplace else, coming to a place where you can rise up with your own sweat uh, and your own hard work and achieve something better than what you might have had elsewhere. So for me, the immigration experiment in, in America will never end because really that's what defines us as a nation. I think Americans are a collection of incredible souls and beings who believe we're all in this together. This is a country where you can take chances. You're allowed to try anything to achieve success, and failure is always there. And in order to, to try things and have failure there, you have to be brave. There's a large can-do attitude in the United States. I think America's a land of opportunity, again, because there were no set rules. We sort of invented it as we went along. It's this belief that wherever you are at any moment in history, whatever your circumstances, that, that radical progress is possible. I believe the United States has, and hopefully will continue to have, some of the great thinkers in terms of entrepreneurship. We are a nation of open-mindedness. I think we love new things. I think we love to try new things. We've sacrificed our blood and treasure for just about every great thing in America, whether it's been on an overseas battlefield or something as seemingly mundane as the Hoover Dam. Over the centuries, there has been a lot of adversity and we have usually triumphed. We're a country that is always prepared to fight back. It's just part of the American character. This country reacts very well under pressure. It goes through these pressurized times and then comes out stronger than before. So I suppose you could say the most defining characteristic is our dynamism. And equally important, we are an optimistic people. We are a people who believe the future is our friend. Everybody was created equal. It's in the Declaration of Independence. You know, all men are created equal. That, that really gives voice to the whole American experience. We still have racial difficulties. We still have disadvantaged people. But the unique thing about America and its diversity and its people is that we are always moving forward and we're always dealing with problems, not ignoring them. Questioning your country and, and constantly going back and examining the beauty of it and the flaws, I think that makes a patriotic American. That's real American character in my mind. I mean, the frontiers that we've conquered is kind of amazing. In a relatively short period of time, America's helped to transform the world. From a few fragile footholds, in just 400 years, America has grown into the most powerful nation on Earth. Born from the enterprising spirit and piety of the first settlers, forged by revolutionary passion and high ideals, driven by a thirst for innovation and technological change. A nation drawn from across the world. America, the story of us.